Good evening, and welcome to our special 20th anniversary in remembrance of 9-11. My name is Joel Westfall, the Deputy Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum. It is my pleasure to welcome back someone who is near family to us at the Ford Library and Museum, Garrett Graff. This is Garrett's fifth lecture for us. We've had Garrett both in Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids discussing his Cold War history, Raven Rock, the story of the US government's secret plan to save itself while the rest of us die, as well as his initial lecture for his oral history of 9-11, The Only Plane in the Sky. This time, we are welcoming him back virtually to discuss the legacy and lingering questions from that horrific day. We will be recording tonight's program for rebroadcast on the Foundation and Museum and Library websites. Tonight's program is available by Zoom and Facebook. Gleaves Whitney, Executive Director of the Gerald R. Ford Foundation, will close tonight's program with your questions. Feel free to ask questions via the chat anytime during tonight's program, either via Zoom or you watching or via Facebook. And as normal, I would like to thank those of you who are friends of Ford who participate and contribute to programs like these to the foundation and make programs like this possible. 20 years later, there are still many lingering questions surrounding the events that took place on September the 11th, 2001. Garrett's book, The Only Plane in the Sky, provides a 360 degree account of that day told by the people who experienced it. In his newly released podcast, Garrett continues that goal by telling the story of that day for a new generation, as well as making sense of some of the questions that still linger. In addition to being an author, Garrett is also a journalist and historian. He has spent more than a dozen years covering politics, technology, and national security. He has written for publications from Wired to the New York Times and served as the editor of two of Washington's most prestigious magazines, The Washingtonian and Politico. Garrett, it is my pleasure to welcome you back again tonight for what I think might be a record-setting fifth lecture at the Ford Library and Museum, I'll bet virtually. Garrett? Joel, uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be with you tonight. Um, and uh, I'm sorry that I'm not in either uh, uh, the museum or the library tonight. Um, but I uh, will look forward to return returning at some future date for a future conversation. Um, I, I, it's my pleasure and honor to speak uh, tonight uh, about the legacy of 9-11, um, which uh, we will mark the 20th anniversary of this uh, coming Saturday and a day that feels especially poignant and especially pregnant this summer as we watch the images out of Afghanistan and the end of the 20-year war there uh, and the American occupation in Afghanistan. I want to talk tonight a little bit both about 9-11 itself and the day and then speak a little bit about the memory uh, of it and then speak finally about the legacy um, and then open it up to questions. Uh, in many ways, the experience of that day is intertwined deeply with the legacy that we feel 20 years later. Um, and I began, uh, I, I came to this project originally through the work that I had previously done on national security. Um, this is the uh, actually the fourth book that I have written where 9-11 uh, plays a pivotal role in the book. Um, and, and as we have seen over the last 20 years, it turns out 9-11 is the hinge on which so much modern history turns. It is in many ways the clearest dividing line that we have between the 20th century and the 21st. And my goal with telling this story as an oral history originally was to try to capture not just the facts of that day, but the experience of that day. And what I mean by that and the distinction that I draw there is that the story that we teach generations uh, now is a very neat and tidy and simple one. We 
speak of the four flights. We say that the whole thing began at 8.46 a.m. Eastern Time with the crash of American Airlines Flight 11 into the North Tower. The whole thing was over 102 minutes later at 10.28 with the collapse of the second tower. We talk of, the sh of Shanksville, we talk of the Pentagon, and we talk of the Twin Towers. But for anyone who was alive that day, that's not the day that any of us actually remember or lived. We didn't know when the attacks began. We didn't know when they were over. We didn't even know for most of 9-11 how many there had been or how bad they were. It's worth remembering that well into the early afternoon, uh, the U.S. government believed that potentially as many as a dozen more hijacked planes might still be in the sky over North America. And that uh, the first day's casualty count at the end of that Tuesday was uh, the, imagine, uh, the, the figure in New York City uh, was that perhaps as many as 10,000 to 20,000 were dead. But even worse than all of that was that none of us knew what came next, that we didn't know what Wednesday afternoon held in store for us, what October might hold in store for us, what might be coming or planned by Al-Qaeda in 2002. And it is that fear, that chaos, that confusion, that trauma of that original day that is worth remembering now 20 years later. Because what we saw that day was an America that was innocent, attacked, and then become fearful. And I, I have always believed in studying 9-11 that the most interesting moment of 9-11 is the 17 minutes between the first crash and the second, 8.46 to 9.03. And in those 17 minutes, you see all of America's innocence. You see from New York commuters to the President of the United States, everyone look at that first crash and effectively shrug. Peter Johansson, the New York Waterways ferry captain uh, that I follow in, the, uh, in, in my book, he talks of how that morning he watched the first crash come across New York Harbor as he was bringing a load of commuters in to lower Manhattan. And that afterward he pulled into Wall Street Terminal and that every single one of the hundred passengers aboard his boat that morning got off and walked into lower Manhattan, walking through the falling debris and the papers fluttering down from the damage to the North Tower. There wasn't a single person aboard the boat who said, you know, this just kind of seems like it's going to be a bad day. I'm going to turn around and work from home. In Washington, Brian Gunderson, the chief of staff to House Majority Leader Dick Armey, turns and as he's walking through his office on his way to his 9 a.m. staff meeting, sees the crash on TV in the reception area and says, I thought it was going to be like a, a bad school shooting, the type of day that where the news is dominated nationally, but it doesn't actually change anyone's schedule. At the White House, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice calls President Bush down in Sarasota, Florida at Emma Booker Elementary School. And they have uh, sort of the same conversation that most Americans had at 846, between 846 and 903. They said, huh, I wonder what happened. That seems strange. Maybe a small plane, maybe the pilot had a heart attack, maybe there was a mechanical problem. And they agreed to monitor it, and Condi Rice went on into her 9 a.m. staff meeting, and President Bush went on into that classroom to read with school children. From top to bottom, in, we all had the same series of thoughts in those 17 minutes. And that it's only in 9.03, with that second crash, United Airlines Flight 175 into the South Tower, where America begins to realize that it's under attack, that America is at war. And what you see begin to transpire over the rest of that day is a level of fear and a level of panic that America had never experienced before. 
but that 20 years later feels very normal to us. In the 20 years since, we have seen mass shootings and terror attacks mar everything from prayers in churches, synagogues, temples, and as well as movie theaters, grocery stores, an Amish school, a, a Native American reservation in Minnesota. And then, of course, actual Islamic extremism hit the United States in places like the Boston Marathon bombing. America is now used to being afraid in public space in a way that it was not on 9-11. And it's important now for a new generation to try to recall that innocence and how it was lost and what it felt like to lose that innocence on the morning of 9-11. A quarter of America is now too young to remember that day. Either they were born after or were too young on 9-11 itself. And the story that they hear is that simple one that I told you. And that that simple one, the four flights, the 102 minutes, that doesn't account for the U.S. government response in the way that the U.S. government and our country and our leaders actually chose to respond that day. And it, now, looking back 20 years later, it's clear to see what actually went wrong. We saw America panic. We saw our government panic. We saw America take this moment of unbelievable unity that unfolded after 9-11, this moment where we saw you know, President Bush's approval ratings at home reach into the 90s. We saw overseas NATO for the first time invoke Article 5 of its charter, the idea that an attack on one is an attack on all. That global unity, that political unity at home, though, was squandered step by step, decision by decision, over the years ahead. The war in Afghanistan led us through a variety of missteps that are now better known and better understood into Iraq, turning the victory, the early victory that we felt in Afghanistan into the loss of both Iraq and Afghanistan. We watched as a ugly strain of nativist, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim uh, politics began to expand in the United States, powering the birtherism movement that by 2008 brings us Barack Obama and the fear in certain circles spoken out loud that he was a closet Mus Muslim born overseas in Kenya. Colin Powell, of course, endorsed Barack Obama in the fall of 2008, both by attacking that notion, but then attacking the very idea of that that was a notion worthy of concern, saying, so what if he was? And he spoke of the Muslims who had fought and died in Iraq and Afghanistan alongside their other Christian, Jewish, and other faith traditions uh, in, uh, in those wars. But of course, from there, we see the politics continue to roil both the United States and Europe in a very clear and deliberate, or a very clear and straight line. I can point you from 9-11 to the rise of nativist nationalist politics in Europe and the Brexit decision to, that ended the dream, the Cold War dream, of a united continental Europe. Here in the United States, we can draw a very straight line from 9-11 to the insurrection at the US Capitol on January 6th. And it's these moments that begin to explain and show us just how wrong the choices were that we made in, uh, in the wake of 9-11 and just how tragic the decisions were that we made as we tried to govern in fear after 9-11. We misidentified our enemies, we mischose our allies, we misorganized our government, and we got our societal answer wrong. Rather than identifying Al-Qaeda as what it was on the morning of 9-11, a terror group with less than 100 active members, not a terrorist army, but a really crowded restaurant. 
It was a group that had identifiable aims, identifiable complaints, and had used identifiable holes in the US security and aviation apparatus to carry out an attack that it never should have been able to get away with. One of the important things to remember as we look back at the legacy of 9-11 is just how many chances the US government actually had to interdict the 9-11 plot that were missed up to and including the fact that the uh, CIA knew that two of the would-be 9-11 hijackers were traveling to the United States under their own name as known Al-Qaeda operatives and failed to tell the FBI, allowing the hijackers known Al-Qaeda operatives to book airplane tickets for the morning of Tuesday, September 11th under their own names. It was one of the most haunting and worst moments in the US, U.S. government on the day of 9-11 as FBI agents and other intelligence officials began to review those flight manifests and actually realized that they recognized the names of the hijackers. They recognized the names aboard those flights. The tragedies unfurled in multiple directions after 9-11. We watched as the U.S. compromised its moral values in the pursuit of the CIA torture program and the black sites, ex extraordinary renditions, and then ultimately ended up with the mess that remains to this day of the Guantanamo prison in Cuba, where 39 today Al-Qaeda uh, and, and war, global war uh, on terror enemy combatants are being held, and yet 20 years after the fact, the U.S. has not managed to bring a single one of them to trial. The, the, the trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the others indicted for 9-11 at Guantanamo may begin next year, it may begin the year after, it's not actually clear to the military that anything will be able to be done with any of these detainees. And Guantanamo, the Guantanamo Bay Naval Base is beginning to make preparations to provide nursing care and hospice care, assuming that the Guantanamo prisoners will die at Guantanamo with justice unserved for the 9-11 victim families. It's an incredible testament of the wasted opportunity that we had after 9-11 to pursue the best angels and the best nature of an American response rather than the amorphous promise to rid the world of evil and terror that we ended up embarking upon. This legacy is important for us to reckon with and it's important for us to speak to, to a new generation. Uh, the, the tragedy in Kabul amid the final days of the U.S. occupation and war there, the 12 U.S. Marines and one U.S. sailor who died in, in that suicide bombing in Kabul, only two of them were actually old enough to be out of diapers on 9-11 itself. And it's incredible to think that this is now a war on terror that is being fought by the children of the first veterans of the war on terror after 9-11, and that increasingly, both among the Taliban and among the US forces in Afghanistan, no one actually has a memory of the day that triggered this 20-year long war. Remembering 9-11 at this moment is also a story, I think, uh, that's worth recapturing uh, that this was not just a day of tragedy and sorrow, that in, in many ways, uh, what has always inspired me about my own work on 9-11, uh, both in the, the book, The Only Plane in the Sky, and my other writing, is that as, uh, as filled as that day was with unimaginable, incalculable sorrow, at the same time, it is a day of extraordinary hope, love, and testimonies to the resilience of the human spirit. Uh, and and I'll, I'll hope to talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A uh, uh, with you all in a little bit. But it is a story uh, of how America in many ways answered the worst evil that man can offer with some of the best that humanity can offer. 
We, and we see this in ways big and small on 9-11, on stories that we have never known or forgotten uh, that need to be carried forward to a new generation. We see it in the work, for instance, of the maritime evacuation of New York City, the largest maritime evacuation in world history, larger than the British evacuation of Dunkirk, pulled together on the morning of 9-11 through a tiny makeshift armada and, and flotilla of about 130 civilian vessels who responded to a call from the U.S. Coast Guard. All available boats, all available boats report to Lower Manhattan to help with the evacuation. They evacuated somewhere between 300,000 and 500,000 people that day from the tip of Lower Manhattan taking people to Staten Island, to Ellis Island, to, uh, to Brooklyn, and to New Jersey. Over the course of the day, the, the work that they did uh, was led by a small group, a, a, a junior Coast Guard lieutenant named Michael Day, and some of the Sandy Hook pilots, the specially licensed seamen who helped navigate vessels in and out of New York Harbor. But that Maritime evacuation is a story that most people don't know at all. Um, a demonstration, I think, in many ways of how many stories and just how big and global the story of 9-11 turned out to be on September the 11th itself. That you have these stories that if they had happened on any other day in modern American history would have turned out to be among the most dramatic events of modern American history. But on that day, actually end up being uh, subsumed and overlooked and not even ranking in the top 10 or 12 most interesting stories, the most dramatic stories of that day. Um, I, I'd love to sort of leave it there and, and open it up uh, with Gleaves to some questions and, and the chance to talk with you all a little bit more tonight um, about, uh, about that day and its legacy and what it means to our country 20 years later. Well, thank you very much, Garrett, for an insightful, engaging conversation. We, uh, this introduction has been splendid. We hope to have a, a good follow-up series of questions for you. Uh, we have a very informed audience. Sometimes they're tough, but I think you'll actually enjoy that because you've done your homework. You've, you've written some great books. So thank you for your gifts that you bring to us and we're eager to get right into some of the questions. So here's one. Uh, you just mentioned that you wanted to talk about the best of the American spirit during the Q&A, and you mentioned a couple of examples, including that heroic maritime evacuation of, of Manhattan Island on 9-11. But, but please, uh, this invites you to elaborate a little bit. What's something else that's near to your heart about the American spirit that you wanted to say? Yeah, so I think one of the things that is most remarkable um, and uh, about that day is that 9-11 is still a story that we are living with. It is a story that we are uh, still wrestling with as a nation and as a people, and one that the victims and survivors of that day, of course, are still living with on their daily basis. Um, uh, Joel mentioned uh, in the introduction um, that I've spent a lot of this year working on a podcast series called Long Shadow, an eight-episode uh, arc, uh, each episode sort of looking at one of the lingering questions of 9-11, questions like, was there a fifth plane? Uh, what was the target of United Airlines Flight 93? Um, what was um, what was the role of the Saudi government in in the uh, in the attacks? Um, who was the twentieth hijacker? Um, uh, questions that have sort of taken us a while to understand, um, or or answers that have evolved with time. Um, it gave me a chance, though, uh, to double back to. Uh, what to me is the most inspiring story that I have actually come across, um, and it'll be the final episode of the podcast on this uh, Saturday on 9-11 itself, um, which is the story of Will Jimeno, uh, who was a Port Authority police officer on 9-11. Um, and, uh, you know, part of 
uh, what what made 9-11 so unique, particularly in New York, was it was a uniquely devastating event um, that uh, you, you either lived or you died, um, and that none of the New York hospitals who readied themselves for mass casualties and trauma cases that day actually had that many. Um, it, there just weren't that many people who survived the actual collapse of the tower. There were, in fact, just 18. Just 18 people survived the collapse of the, the tower, almost all of them firefighter, New York City firefighters uh, located in stairwell B of the North Tower. Um, just two people were actually pulled from underneath the towers. People actually rescued from the rubble underneath the collapse of the towers. Uh, Port Authority Police Officer Will Jimeno and his Sergeant John McLaughlin. Um, they were featured in the Oliver Stone, Nicolas Cage movie, World Trade Center, uh, which people might have a vague memory of. Um, they were in the basement of the South Tower when the South Tower first collapsed uh, with a team of five PAPD officers. Uh, two of the officers were killed in that first collapse a third killed in the subsequent collapse of the North Tower as they are trapped under the rubble. And Will and John survive through the day and are actually found uh, late that evening around 8 p.m. by two uh, former U.S. Marines who sort of self-deployed uh, and put on their camouflage fatigues and reported to Crown Zero to conduct their own search and rescue effort. Um, it's an improbable story in many ways of how uh, these two men found uh, Will Jimeno and John McLaughlin amid the hellscape that was the World Trade Center on the evening of uh, Tuesday, September the 11th. They were found about 8 p.m., took about three hours to dig Will out. Um, Sergeant McLaughlin was pulled out uh, at around 7 a.m. the following morning, the second to last person found alive in, uh, in the rubble of the World Trade Center. Um, uh, but that's the story that sort of most people know. That's the story that Oliver Stone told. Um, but I've gotten the chance to know Will through my book research and, and my writing. Um, and what I find most remarkable about him is exactly what I was saying about the, the resilience of the human spirit, that he, he goes on to uh, struggle in the years ahead with first undiagnosed PTSD uh, from his experience. Um, he, it takes him about a year to physically recover from uh, being trapped in the rubble. Um, but then uh, he, uh, it takes him actually much longer to mentally recover, to recover from the, the PTSD um, and, and to learn to both confront it and then to manage it. Um, he's very forthright about the fact that he is uh, never going to beat PTSD. No one beats PTSD. As he says, the day that I beat PTSD will be the day that they lay me in the ground. But he's learned to manage it. He's learned to recognize his triggers. He's learned the strategies to uh, get to, to break out of what he calls the hamster wheel uh, of anger. Um, and what he has devoted the last 10 years to is speaking to audiences uh, who are undergoing their own struggles, um, and uh, this is, you know, this can be, uh, you know, uh, people struggling with addiction, with abuse, um, jail inmates, um, you know, military, uh, 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 military personnel, police academies. I mean, sort of people who are struggling or are likely to face uh, a, a struggle. Um, and then he speaks to a lot of elementary, middle school, high school, and college students. And the message that he gives each of them is that he's not defined by the building that fell upon him. He's defined by what he did after, what he did despite of the World Trade Center falling on top of him. 
and he talks about how people come up to him and say, Will, I can't imagine anything worse than the 220 stories of the World Trade Center falling on top of you. But what he, but his message is, is trauma isn't competitive and it's not comparative. That your trauma can mean just as much to you as his does to him. And that when the World Trade Center falls on any of us, that's what it feels like. That whether it's uh, the death of a loved one, whether it's the loss of a job, whether it's a bad breakup, a divorce, whether it's addiction, whether it's abuse, whether it's depression, um, you can feel like the World Trade Center fell on top of you at some point in your life. And almost all of us will experience that at some point. And that it is, uh, uh, that life is about, that his message is about what you do in that moment and how you begin to pick yourself back up. And, and that to me is sort of the remarkable tale of that day. And it's the most hopeful and inspirational tale that I have ever found in my years of work at, um, uh, in my years of work on 9-11. Um, and, and I should mention, Will actually published a, a memoir this spring, this summer, um, called Sunrise Through the Darkness, that uh, if any of you are struggling with trauma, um, I, I would encourage you to, um, to take a look at and, and sort of read his journey and sort of how it might help you live. Um, because, you know, part of the challenge when we look back on the legacy of these last 20 years is Will, in some ways, was the first person to be injured with the signature injury of the war on terror, that um, we have seen PTSD become sort of the hallmark and calling card of service in Iraq, Afghanistan, and all of the war zones that we have sent people to over the last 20 years. Because what we've done is we've sent them to wars where the front lines are amorphous and a much higher percentage of uh, American service personnel find themselves in combat experiences than in past wars. Um, four million Americans have served in the war on terror in the years since 9-11, um, about 78% of which have actually seen something that they would define as combat. And one in three of those struggles with the mental and emotional toll of what they've seen and what they've been asked to do. Um, and all of that has contributed to what we have seen be this very well documented, uh, a, a, you know, and, and frankly sort of shameful epidemic of veteran suicide in the United States. That, you know, when we talk about the casualties of the war on terror, it's about 7,100 people who have died in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan and it's about 35,000 veterans who have died of suicide during that same period. Um, and this is something that we need to spend a lot more time as a country, a lot more resources, and a lot more empathy struggling with and reckoning with of what that legacy means for the men and women that we've called to arms. Thank you for such a moving tribute to our veterans and recognizing the fact that they've suffered in ways that we still haven't adequately accounted for, Garrett. I'm just curious, as an economist, has anybody tried to calculate not just the psychological cost, the moral injury, the soul repair that needs to happen because of the PTS, but has anybody calculated the economic cost of what all of this has meant? Yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the numbers that you see is that we've spent, you know, somewhere between three trillion and six trillion on our, um, uh, 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 on the sort of collective war on terror over the last 20 years. Um, but this is going to be something, you know, these are not costs that go away, um, you know, now that we are out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you know, we are going to be living with the legacy of these wars for decades to come. Um, and, and in fact, actually, the year that the U.S. government predicts that the veteran health care costs of the war on terror will peak is 2050. So 30 years from now, we expect 
the costs of the war on terror to finally begin to decline, which is just sort of a stunning realization that this will have been a half century of costs that we are bearing through this war. A viewer asks, what burden does the generation who lived through 9-11 have in keeping that legacy alive? Yeah, and, and it's a tough one. Um, you know, one of the things that has always struck me in my work on 9-11 um, and uh, it, it is, you know, this sort of weird moment as a journalist and a historian where you're sort of calling people up out of the blue and saying, hey, can you relive in extreme detail the most traumatic and worst moments of your life? Um, and, you know, can I ask you a ton of super probing questions about, uh, you know, w the worst things that you have ever seen as a human being, uh, um, you know, as I do these oral histories on 9-11 um, and people's experiences. And what always amazes me is people say yes, that, um, uh, that, that people sort of understand, I think, either explicitly or implicitly that this national mantra that we have of never forget actually requires us to never forget. And that sort of if you, if you survived that day, um, I think you feel a great burden to try to keep that memory alive for all of the people who, di who, who didn't survive that day. Um, and this is something that I think uh, that generation who lived through that day will really remember. But I think part of what I hope to do with my book and my work, um, and then I, what, what I think is part of the understanding of um, people, uh, as we sort of watch this new generation come of age who have been shaped by 9-11 have any memory of it. I mean, remember last year was the first time that people born after 9-11 were eligible to vote in a presidential election. Um, and that uh, we have to keep the memory of that day alive because it helps explain why the U.S. government did what it did, why our country made the choices that we did. Um, because uh, some of these choices uh, make sense in the context of the life that we were living after 9-11. And it's also, you know, some of this is thinking about more than just 9-11 itself. I mean, when you go back and talk to people in the U.S. government in the months after 9-11 and they talk about the response and uh, and the, the dark decisions that they made to condone torture to condone uh, um, black sites and extraordinary renditions, they thought that they were doing the thing that was in the best interest of the country. They thought that they were making decisions necessary to protect the United States against the onslaught of terror that they felt was coming. And so, you know, we talk of 9-11 as this very discreet event, this thing that happened on a bright blue Tuesday in September, but for the people who lived it, it was inescapable uh, and, and deeply intertwined with all of the events that came after. The anthrax letters of, uh, of October 2001, Richard Reed and the shoe bomber, sort of the, you know, this thing, this, this now in hindsight sort of relatively minor uh, um, terror plot um, uh, that that never saw uh, actual success, um, but those types of drumbeats, that type of action, uh, continued to keep the fear of U.S. government uh, leaders about what we were facing. And then you fast forward a year, the fall of 2002, you see the D.C. sniper uh, case playing out across Washington. You see the very government officials who are plotting our response to the war on terror, having to duck and run across, uh, you know, when they are out running errands. Um, you know, you see their school kids and children kept inside from recess because of the fear of snipers targeting them at the playground. Um, you know, this is all the environment of 9-11. This is the environment in which these officials were making choices uh, and decisions and keeping that memory, that that experience of what it was like to live through that 
not just the historical facts of what happened and didn't, um, I think is really important for this next generation. Another viewer asks about uh, comparing 9-11 to Pearl Harbor. What are your thoughts about that? To what extent do you agree that uh, it's a useful conversation to have? Um, so I uh, don't have real strong memories of Pearl Harbor, um, but my memory uh, uh, or sort of the work that I've done in this field, um, I think you see a very similar arc um, in, in certain respects um, and then a very different arc in another respect. Um, in the years immediately after uh, December 7th, 1941, there was a real national reckoning with December 7th. You know, it was a, um, you know, not an official holiday, but sort of marked as a holiday for many years um, through the 1940s and 1950s. It was the type of day that you avoided scheduling other things on that, uh, you know, America remembered Pearl Harbor on December 7th. 9-11, we've seen sort of a similar arc in the years immediately after 9-11. You know, it was a date that people set aside for memorials and services uh, and commemorations. It was not the, you know, it was not the day that you got married or hosted your kid's birthday party or you know, had some sort of big glamorous gala. Um, and yet, as we get further and further away from uh, 2001, we are beginning to sort of see the date of September 11th, um, this year, of course, being an exception with the 20th, sort of return to normal use as a day. You know, it's the type of thing that you, w that you wouldn't think twice anymore of booking a flight on September 11th in the way that you know, pe many people sort of actively avoided flying on September 11th in 2002, 2003, 2004. Um, the the major difference is, I, I think one of the things that's really worth reckoning with is the length of the war that has come. Um, you know, every single person who fought in World War II has a memory of Pearl Harbor. Um, you know, they understood in a visceral, emotional way what it meant for the nation to be attacked that day and what they, in turn, were fighting for. Today, we are now seeing a generation called to these wars uh, who don't remember that day. Um, you know, the Marines have actually instituted training at uh, Paris Island. Um, they're, uh, 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 as part of sort of recruit training about 9-11 because they, they were, they, they sort of realized that many uh, of their new recruits actually no longer remember that day at all. They don't have a good understanding of it. Um, and that we see the same on the other side, by the way. I mean, it, when we speak of Afghanistan, when we f speak of this summer's fighting, Many of the Taliban fighters on the other side also don't remember 9-11. Um, you know, this is a war that has consumed an entire generation on both sides. Uh, and it's going to get sort of harder and harder, I think, for these fights to tie back to 9-11 uh, um, as we get further away. Um, I have a three-year-old daughter. Um, uh, and uh, as I was writing this book, uh, one of the things that really stuck out to me was uh, I was born in 1981. And for my daughter, 9-11 uh, is exactly as far removed for her as the Kennedy assassination is to me. Um, you know, that sort of 17 year difference. Um, and, you know, I remember growing up and talking to my parents about the Kennedy assassination. I remember talking to teachers about it. I remember, you know, them talking of what a searing experience that was. Um, but to me, you know, the Kennedy assassination was like, it was black and white TV. Like it was, the, you know, it was the oldest thing that I could imagine happening in the world. Um, and it's strange to realize um, that that's how my daughter is going to look at 9-11. Um, at, at and in some ways, like when you go back and look at 
um, it really does feel like ancient history now. Um, you know, when we uh, we speak of 9-11, we sort of think of it as part of our modern world, but you go back and you look, um, that's 1990s fashion and 1990s suits that people are wearing um, on in the pictures of, of September 11th. Um, you know, the, the high tech uh, tools that the White House traveling party had with the president in Florida that day, two way pagers. They, 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 had, uh, they had this cutting edge tool where if when they received a page, they could send back uh, one of, I think it was 18 pre-programmed responses. Um, and you know that, that level of communication is just sort of unimaginable to us today. This next question is really intriguing. It's by, um, it's submitted by Lois Atterbury, and she tells of her husband, a pilot for Continental Airlines, who flew routinely between Newark Airport and Tel Aviv. So in 2001, he left Newark. He landed in at 10 a.m. in Tel Aviv in our, in, um, I guess, Eastern time. And she says there was never a, a, a flight marshal, sky marshal on mm -hmm. board. But on that morning, so the, the plane that, that left, you know, Newark on the 10th, uh, that flight, there were four fire, uh, sky marshals. Huh. What, what do you think our government knew? Um, so, so one thing to, that, you know, as we go back and we look at um, and, uh, uh, that day uh, and that summer, is there was actually widespread knowledge uh, in the U.S. government that an attack was coming. Um, you know, George Tennant has spoken of this, the CIA director at the time, the, the, as he said, the system was blinking red and that uh, there was real fear uh, across the U.S. government that Al Qaeda was planning a big attack. Um, the, uh, the expectation of that summer was that it was an attack that was going to come overseas. And so, um, you know, I, I, uh, I don't have any personal knowledge of that um, Continental Airlines flight um, or, or the Sky Marshals um, uh, that day. Uh, I, I will sort of accept, accept it for the purposes of, of this conversation and, and say um, it's entirely possible that the U.S. government was very actively targeting um, flights bound overseas to uh, um, it, 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 you know, volatile regions like uh, the Middle East um, in that summer as they worried about what would come next. Um, and you know, the FBI was very actively trying to chase plots that summer. The CIA was actively trying to chase plots. Um, you know, we all remember um, the, uh, the August 6th pres presidential daily brief uh, that Michael Morell, the CIA briefer, gave President Bush in Crawford, Texas. Osama bin Laden determined to strike targets inside the United States. Um, you know, there was a lot of recognition that there was a big attack coming. Um, and that makes it in some ways all the more tragic uh, that the U.S. government uh, was unable to actually intercept and interdict the plot as it did. Now, this is uh, another intriguing question. Uh, a viewer named Emma asks, she said, didn't you say that you could trace a direct line to the January 6th riots on Capitol Hill? Please be more specific about that. Yeah, um, and, and what I mean by that is, uh, um, I, I think you see a very straight line connection between the politics that unfurl after 9-11 that lead to the birtherism movement that helps power Donald Trump to the presidency. Uh, and, and, and that, uh, you know, remember sort of one of Donald Trump's first actions as president was the Muslim travel ban, um, you know, very explicitly targeted at the idea of the people who had attacked us on 9-11. Um, and that sort of stoking that anti-immigrant uh, nationalist uh, strain of our politics um, is a big part of what led to 
uh, the, 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 the movements that sort of coalesced um, into um, the, the mob that stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Um, so, it, you know, it, I, I don't mean in any way to imply that there were Islamic extremists or Al Qaeda behind the, the January 6th. Um, I'm talking about sort of the political change that 9-11 wrought in our culture and the downstream effects of that. As you look at the institutions, all the institutions that curate our collective memories, so schools, universities, museums, the media, historical societies, Hollywood and the like, which ones do you think are best at telling the truth about 9-11? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and um, I, I have been thinking about this both in the context of 9-11 and then actually the COVID pandemic as well, that um, the, the challenge uh, of telling the 9-11 story um the the 9-11 museum i think does very well it's not perfect by by any stretch you can sort of uh read a big article in uh, new york magazine uh um uh in the last couple of weeks about sort of some of the trade-offs that they made in their uh in, in their displays and the way that they sort of reckon with that day um I think it, for the most part, it does a very good job of capturing that day. Um, what is much harder for a museum, the 9-11 museum or, or, or anyone really to capture is the downstream effects um, and, and sort of what 9-11 did to us and what we did in the wake of 9-11. Um, uh, my book drew on uh, some incredible oral history projects that were done by the 9-11 Museum, the 9-11 Tribute Center, uh, the Library of Congress, the Pentagon, the U.S. Capitol Historian, uh, C-SPAN, um, the Fire Department in New York, um, as well as, you know, dozens of other projects by places like the Arlington County Public Library, the Museum of the Chinese in America. Um, and, and other journalistic endeavors, um, all of which had the great sense to go out after 9-11 and to grab um, uh, up these stories, you know, somewhat contemporaneously. I mean, the, the Pentagon historian was interviewing people for oral histories in October 2001. Um, but what I've been thinking a lot about over this last year, year and a half, is uh, how challenging this COVID pandemic is going to be for future historians. Because one of the things that makes 9-11 unique as an experience is that we all basically had the same 9-11 experience. Um, that uh, it, it was in some ways uh, the first global catastrophe that the world has ever seen. The fact that it happened at 9 a.m. on the East Coast in the United States meant that it was in the middle of, uh, you know, it was, it was midday, early afternoon, late afternoon in, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Africa, um, that it was early evening, late evening across Asia. Um, and so most of the world was able to watch and live parts of the 9-11 experience uh, in the same way that those of us did here in the United States watching it on TV. And so from an oral history perspective, that's a wonderful way to try to tell the story because you have so many people who can be representative of many others in their experience. Whereas uh, what is going to be so challenging is that none of us have had the same COVID pandemic. Um, that uh, my pandemic experience here in Burlington, Vermont, where I live, uh, is truly only unique to me. Um, you know, it's not even reflective necessarily of the experience that other people in Burlington have had. Um, it's not, it's certainly not reflective of the experience that you all have had in Michigan. Um, it, it, you know, the, the rural divide, the urban divide, the red state divide, the blue state divide, um, you know, the, the waves have taken place at, at different times in different parts of the country. Um, you know, my state has an incredibly high vaccination rate. Um, we've had a low case rate over the course of this last year and a half. So, you know, it has been relatively safe. Uh, and as a community, we have cared about one another. And that's not necessarily the case uh, for many other people in many other parts of the, the country. 
Um, and you know, you look at someone in Florida, you look at someone in Louisiana, you look at someone in Arizona or Idaho right now, and they're having an incredibly different experience than I did um, to um, in, in, in here in Vermont. And that's going to be a real challenge for any historians who set out to try to tell the story of this pandemic to a new generation who's not familiar with the ins and outs of it. We are running out of time, Garrett. We have just time for a couple of more questions. And I think you have a real fan who's read your books and seen every one of your uh, appearances at the Ford. And she wants to know about your next book. Uh, so my next book uh, is actually right there on the wall behind me. Um, and, and, I, and it's one that I hope I will get the chance to come back to the Ford Library because it actually has a not insignificant Gerald Ford uh, component to it. Um, I, I have uh, just finished a one volume history of, uh, of Watergate um, that will be coming out in February, uh, available to pre-order wherever you get your books. Um, and the goal with this uh, book was to, um, to try to tell, again, the story of Watergate for a new generation. Um, and it's actually a story that has not been told since Mark Felt's identity came out as Deep Throat. Um, Mark Felt, the, the Washington Post source uh, known as Deep Throat, the FBI uh, number two, number three, through the course of the Watergate scandal. And uh, that revelation, that sort of uh, uh, understanding of who Deep Throat was actually uh, pretty dramatically rewrites the story of 9-11 as we know, or the story of Watergate as we know it. Um, and so it was a great opportunity uh, to try to dive into another monumental uh, hinge point in modern American politics uh, to try to tell a, a story that we sort of think we know, uh, but that actually turns out to be uh, extraordinarily different than the story that most of us think we know. Garrett, you know this question's coming. In the course of researching Watergate, did you learn anything about President Ford that surprised you or changed your opinion of him? Um, so, uh, so the short answer is no. Um, you know, I, I think sort of part, of, and obviously this is something that uh, uh, you all at the Ford Library and Museum and the Foundation have all uh, probably spent more time thinking about than I have. Um, uh, but I was really struck in the course of my work uh, at understanding uh, sort of just how clear eyed he was about the decision to pardon Nixon um, and the pressure that he felt in at that moment from various sides um, and his understanding of sort of the huge political cost that uh, would uh, would come about uh in his own career if he moved forward with it and he did it anyway uh thinking it was the right thing to do for the country thinking it was the right thing to do for sort of his presidency to be able to move forward um but again you know that that fall um of, of 1974 um is is one of those moments that uh a lot of people don't really remember uh, or, or know sort of just how uh, strange and dark that fall actually was. I mean, that Richard Nixon himself uh, sort of ends up, uh, you know, uh, emotionally and physically broken uh, from the stress of Watergate uh, in the hospital, comes close to dying uh, that fall, um, uh, and that, uh, uh, you know, Gerald Ford is sort of reckoning with all of this as he's trying to start his own presidency. It's a remarkable moment of political courage in the modern American presidency. Well, on behalf of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library, Museum and Foundation, thank you, Garrett, for another really insightful presentation to our friends of Ford. You're fifth and counting, and we will want you back again to talk about Watergate. You're always insightful and engaging. You know, insightful, engaging speakers like Garrett are what make the Ford Foundation special, the library and museum special, the programs we put on together. If your life was enriched by this evening's program, if your perspective was challenged or changed in any way, 
then we uh, hosted a successful program and we hope that you will consider becoming a friend of Ford. Please visit our website at GeraldRFordFoundation.org to join. There you'll find exciting upcoming programs. For example, the Gerald R. Ford is celebrating its 40th anniversary this month and we are really excited to have the opportunity to bring Richard Norton Smith to you next Thursday on September 16th, Thursday evening at 7 p.m. He will be speaking with, uh, we'll have Hank Meyer as his interlocutor talking about his new book on Ford uh, that he's just finishing up. And uh, you'll have the opportunity to see Mike Ford along the way and others. So we hope you can join us next Thursday, September 16th. Help us celebrate the 40th anniversary of the library, the museum, and the foundation. I'm Gleaves Whitney. Good night and stay safe. <laughs>